Parker Bowles and Lady Diana Spencer both fell for a bumbling bachelor. She was probably in love with him before she even got to meet him. It was fairy tale stuff. Each strived to spend as much time as they could with their Prince Charming. She had been with Prince Charles 13 or 14 days in total during the courtship. Apart from when Charles was on official duty, there was no time Camilla and Charles' relationship didn't continue. But with an aching chasm of age, experience and personalities between them... Charles said to her, just keep an eye on Diana and help her along the way, which is what Camilla did. Their lives became interwoven throughout two tumultuous decades. I can't imagine that Camilla wasn't on Prince Charles's mind as he walked up and down the aisle. Often when it shouldn't. That's having cake and eating it. As royal commentators dispel the myth of the monarchy. They ended up with the king doing the conga round the state rooms of Buckingham Palace. Experts will break down key archive from crucial moments in royal history. It was a fairy tale created by the Grimm brothers. So prepare to discover what actually happens when blue blood runs red. What have you been doing in here all day? This is The Royals Revealed. In this episode, we'll reveal how these two women, who seemed worlds apart, would become forever linked. Her school friend said of Camilla, she is pathologically ambitious. She will only marry a very rich, influential, powerful man. She wants to have fun. Whereas with Diana, you never got that sense that her main purpose in life was to have fun. Events would bring the most unlikely love triangle together. There were people who had colluded in what turned out to be the biggest con job that the British royal family had ever pulled on the nation. Everybody is um, emotionally engaged, but then there's this small distance around this one woman, Camilla. She's doing what I call meerkat body language. So you just get this lone woman looking up and just gazing very coldly, assessing her potential rival as she goes up the aisle and how both women would go on to blow the monarchy wide open. We are not in the business of hyping publications, was the only comment from Buckingham Palace this morning. Diana, her true story, looks certain to be on the way to the top of the bestsellers list. She thought that she, she was mischaracterized as this woman inside the royal family, and she wanted to express who she really was. The Camilligate tapes were virtually pornographic. I mean. For a member of the royal family to be saying the sort of things he says on the tape to a woman uh, he was not married to was really extraordinary. But had the fuse already been set long before? Diana and Camilla are widely regarded as the epitome of chalk and cheese. There's often a comparison drawn between the type of person Diana was and the type of person Camilla is. Uh, Camilla was very down-to-earth, very jolly hockey sticks, smoked, drank, whereas Diana, she kind of thrived on the, on the media coverage. Uh, it was pretty important to her. She was, she was desperate to be, to be noticed. There's uh, this sense that Diana was regarded as very beautiful and uh, alluring, whereas Camilla, not as much. Camilla is quite a mothering influence, really. Somebody with the confidence to buoy up and reassure Prince Charles, who's himself a very introspective, deep-thinking person. Diana, however, more of a fragile character in many regards. The love triangle began at the start of the 70s, when Charles was in his early 20s. Camilla used to go to the polo in the early 70s to follow her boyfriend, Andrew Parker Bowles, who was at that stage, the great polo player uh, of Great Britain. And uh, Prince Charles, by comparison, was a very poor polo player. The young prince rides like a cowboy. In perfect coordination, lad and pony gallop goldward. Camilla was 16 months Charles's senior, and the young royal found her irresistible. He'd had a couple of relationships with girls after he'd come out of university, but he was sexually very inexperienced. The same cannot be said of Camillo. And uh, I think that he, what he was looking for was someone to lead him up uh, the golden path to happiness in the bedroom, and she did it for him. But fun in the bedroom wasn't their only shared passion. 
she loved the goons as well, so they had that in common. They had horses, they had humour, and if you've got a sense of humour in common, then you can go a long way with that. The thing about Camilla is she's not the sort of shy, retiring, innocent creature that Charles, at some stage, may have thought he should marry. She's free, she's easygoing, she's boisterous, she's fun, unfettered. And put her in a situation where she's coming across people who have to live a life that is drilled down, regimented, ordered, you have a script to live by, she's going to be dynamite to somebody like that. So whenever Charles mounted his trusty steed, Camilla would be right behind him. There was a, a queue of girls who wanted to become Prince Charles's girlfriend, but uh, it was Camilla who got him. As well as their mutual appreciation for all things equine. They'd made an unlikely connection long before this famous snap was taken. The old, old story is that Camilla went up to Charles and said, your great-great-grandfather and my great-grandmother were lovers, so how about it? So was being a mistress Camilla's destiny? Her great-great-grandmother was Alice Keppel, who was Edward VII's favourite mistress. I think that Camilla had studied the way that her great-grandmother had gone about remaining part of the royal circle, and she followed suit. So it's like history repeating itself. Diana and Charles, too, had a close family connection, as Charles had romanced Diana's sister, Sarah Spencer. I've heard it on good authority that Charles actually was really, really keen on her, but she wasn't so keen on him. I think she saw him as quite a weak man. So it'll come as no surprise. It wasn't long before the Sarah Spencer allegiance hit a slippery slope. She very famously said whether he was a dustman or the King of England, she wouldn't marry him. It may well be that, um, that Charles moved on, as it were, to Diana because it was a sort of consolation prize. She had an idealised uh, fascination with him. She had posters of him up on her wall. But the relationship between Camilla and Diana would become too close for comfort. In the 1970s, Prince Charles had enjoyed a string of romances. There were a lot of them. There were a lot of very attractive ladies on his arm, but nothing, none of them particularly serious. As the decade drew to a close, it was felt that any horsing around should be put to rest. And for Charles to find someone to bring some feminine delicacy to his stuffy solo exploits. What don't you like about that? If you move, they bash you on the face. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to discover whether they keep the flies on. I think the Queen Mother and Prince Philip both tried to give him a nudge in the marriage direction and say to him, look, it's probably time now that you settle down. But um, it was just a question of finding the right bride. He was also uh, um, being attacked by the British press because he promised that by his 30th birthday he'd be married. That was a foolish mistake. He should never have said it. I think Camilla felt she probably, she was a tough woman, but I think she was hurt at that time. Um, by the fact that by knowing that the royal family just couldn't accept her because she wasn't young, she wasn't um, innocent. They were looking for a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant aristocratic virgin and somebody who would tick all those boxes. Charles fell hook, line and sinker for Camilla from the moment they first went to bed together. But she knew that she could never be a royal wife. By the time he came across Diana, he was getting pretty desperate. But when they had their first proper conversation, it was definitely not a time for flirtation. It was just after the Henri uncle, Lord Mountbatten, had been assassinated by the IRA. And Diana said to him how awful this was and how difficult it must have been for him at the funeral. Once she said that, um, he was all over her, like a, to use her phrase, like a bad rash. 
Lord Mayor Batten actually played a very cynical role in uh, Prince Charles's love life. On the one hand, he allowed his house at Broadlands to be used as a base for Charles and Camilla to go to bed together. On the other hand, uh, he was using it as a place where Charles could meet other girls in the hope that sooner or later one of them would stick. And he was determined, if he possibly could, to have a hand in queen making. It's thought Lord Mountbatten, seven years previously, was so determined for Charles to stop his affair with Camilla and concentrate on securing a suitable bride, he arranged for him to be posted abroad. Charles had a strong desire to want to get engaged, to want to be with Camilla, and then guess what? He sent away for seven months. Now, it's a normal human reaction. If this is someone you're in love with, you're emotionally bonded with, and they're sent away, you're going to want it even more. And I think this is exactly what may have happened with Charles. Whether royal strings were being pulled or not, while Charles was at sea, Camilla had married Andrew Parker Bowles, and as they moved into the 80s, the press were promoting a new potential princess. Initially, Diana was portrayed as shy Di. She was very much considered somebody who went around her business with her head bowed, not a particularly extroverted character. In some of the um, footage, we can see that she's actually doing a complete cut-off gesture, which is that she's completely covering her face with her hands. Now, it made her look haunted and hunted. It implies that she's not enjoying it. And also, I think that was more for Charles, that signalling, that, look, I'm not vying for publicity, I'm not gloating about the fact that I might be the woman of your dreams, and also, I wouldn't mind a little bit of protection and looking after as well. I think she was trying to trigger that part of Charles's psyche that I don't think he ever had. Diana, the moment she burst onto the national scene was seen as a perfect English rose and she was seen as the perfect match for Prince Charles. Diana was also a virgin and it was felt at the time that Charles should be marrying a virgin. The attractive, shy and innocent Diana may have been a suitable match for the firm, but perhaps not for Charles. At this point, Charles was doing what he became so good at, he would have won a medal for it in the, if it was an Olympic sport, which was ignoring Diana. So he'd gone out with her, and he's talking, I think, to Camilla's husband. And we can see Diana, she's just been left alone at that moment, even though he's standing next to her, and I think she does look fed up. Even when we saw her with him, we were seeing her alone. They never pitched up like a double act. Yet far from keeping his mistress and his betrothed separate, remarkably, many of Charles and Diana's early meetings came at the Parker Bowles estate in Wiltshire. When I was working with Diana on her biography, we, we worked out that she had been with Prince Charles about 13 or 14 days in total during the courtship. And most of that time, they were at Bowlhide Manor, which is where Camilla and Andrew Parker Bowles lived, or that they were at the races with Camilla, or there was some, uh, some other function with Camilla. She was always present. And I think there was a naivety around Diana's attitude towards the relationship between Charles and Camilla, that they were close friends, both from the kind of equestrian horsey set, had known each other for years. I don't think Diana realised that they were carrying on as lovers behind the scenes. I wonder whether this was Charles's attempt to integrate the two sides of his life, love and the intimacy with Camilla and duty marrying the virginal Diana. That's having cake and eating it. So yes, the wives, girlfriends, lovers would go and watch their other halves playing the game and that's how they were kind of thrown together. And Camilla had been around the traps for quite some time and Charles said to her, as one would to a friend, just keep an eye on Diana and help her along the way. When the two women are talking to one another, or at least Camilla seems to be communicating with Diana, the smile that she's wearing is so affectionate and maternal, which is really weird. So I find that kindly smile not, not, not nice, really. Funnily enough, I think that Camilla, more than anything, who was in on the secret, wanted Diana to be happy with Prince Charles. She was ready to step back, allow Diana to become the royal wife, although she wanted to remain the royal mistress. 
All eyes were on Diana as she attended her first official royal engagement, apart perhaps from Charles's. There was almost palpable embarrassment from Charles, who decided to pretend that she wasn't with him for the entire evening. We can see him in all of this footage ignoring her. Not one friendly glance, even when they walk up the staircase. He just glances in case she might trip, but he even puts his hand in his pocket on the side that she's on, which is a rejection gesture. It's kind of, I'm not going to touch you, I'm not really with you. It was an eye-catching display by Diana, and even Cam That Camilla and Charles had discussed the fact um, that it might be a good idea for Charles to marry Diana. If you were unkind, you would say that Camilla endorsed Diana because she thought she might be a bit of a walkover. What an incredible misreading of the situation that turned out to be. With Charles somewhat loafing on the matter of marriage, the other intimidating male influence on in his life stepped in. Prince Philip sent Prince Charles a letter during the demands with Diana saying, either ask her to marry him or let her go because this kind of speculation is, is, is not good for her reputation in the future. So just make your mind up. Charles swiftly did his duty and popped the question. But even this special moment had Camilla's presence lingering all over it. Charles proposed to Diana at the Parker Bowles estate. Whether it was in the vegetable patch or the strawberry patch, I don't think anyone's absolutely sure. But um, I haven't seen it denied, and I've been told that that's certainly where it happened. Though the news was still to be announced, Charles had spilled the beans to Camilla, who'd somehow managed to leave a letter of congratulation in Diana's bedroom, saying how she couldn't wait to see the ring. Notes on pillows have to be convened by one of two people, either Prince Charles himself from Camilla or one of their closest aides. But second of all, I think the idea that Camilla had knowledge of this intimate moment ahead of anyone else must have served as a wake-up call to the fact that Charles was clearly treating Camilla as the ultimate confidant. She later complained about it and said uh, that Camilla knew more about her movements and activities than she, Diana, knew herself. Quite clear what Camilla was doing when she put a letter on, on Diana's pillow. It was to find out what the lie of the land was like and how could she uh, still see Prince Charles. It speaks volumes about the extent to which she is a woman who can control situations, who wants to control situations. And for Charles, that's the great appeal. Diana, she wasn't a woman of the world. Uh, she hadn't had any boyfriends, but that is about the sum total of her 19 years. And then all of a sudden, she becomes engaged to Charles. In the obligatory interview that followed, Charles was hardly selling the notion he was smitten. At what point did you decide that um, this was the right, the right lady for you? I mean, well, um, gradually. He was groaning and moaning and, well, mm, and it was a gradual process. And for her, it was instant. You know, she saw this man, she knew who he was. She was probably in love with him before she even got to meet him. It was fairy tale stuff. She was playing up to the cameras. She knew what her script was. She was ready to say, I am in love with this man and it's all going to be wonderful. But he, unfortunately, a man of some conscience, was thinking, Camilla's watching this. And did Charles's attempt to be tactile further betray his inner thoughts? It looked incredibly romantic in a way. Um, you know, try it on yourself. It, you, it, who strokes a finger downwards? It's, it's not nice. It doesn't feel nice. It's not a reassuring gesture. It's almost a gesture of somebody who's never touched anybody else. It, it, it's, you'd go sideways or you'd go from the knuckle up to the fingertip, not the other way. So even that must have felt quite weird for her, I'm afraid. And away from the uneasy hand stroking, Charles really put his foot in it. Can you find the words to sum up how you feel today, both of you? Difficult to find that mm. sort of word, isn't it, really? Just delighted and, and happy. And I, I, I'm amazed that she's uh, been brave enough to take me on. <laughs> and I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> Well, it obviously means two very happy people. Yes. Once again, congratulations. Well, from us, congratulations. Thank you, Thank you very much. Very kind. 
That was the point that her fairy tale marriage, you could see that it was a fairy tale created by the Grimm brothers. You know, it just it collapsed, and you can see her face went down like that, his face went down like that. Was that the first sign that Diana looked across to the man who would be king, the man who would be her husband, and thought to herself, good grief, I may have made a dreadful mistake here? A few days later, as Charles departed for a trip down under, further signs emerged that all may not have been well. There's footage showing Diana crying as Prince Charles leaves for a, a tour of Australia. And people think it's because she's mis miserable that he's going away. Part of that was true, but also it was the fact that when she uh, entered the waiting room at the airport, um, he's on the phone to Camilla. And sh she thinks, I'll just leave them to it. But she, by then, she's realising that this relationship is far more complicated and far more sincere and long-lasting than she'd ever uh, thought. So these weren't tears of grief at their parting. They were a sign of a wash with excitement about the upcoming marriage of Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer. Why have you come here today? To try and get a glimpse of Diana and Charles. The nation was certainly gripped by wedding fever in the lead up to Charles and Diana's wedding, not least because it had followed the so-called winter of discontent. So to have something to celebrate at last in 1981, and also the making of this fairy tale with a proper fairy tale bride. But two people perhaps weren't in such high spirits, as Camilla strived to ascertain where she stood. Camilla and her other friends were assessing Diana, and Camilla is very intrigued to know whether um, Diana is going to hunt. And she says, no, she's not. And so Camilla was relieved about that. And that really was the fact that it meant that she still had an avenue to see Prince Charles on a regular basis. Meanwhile, Diana's suspicions of Camilla were also on the rise. I think that Diana was feeling a bit tender and a bit sore and a bit neglected as well by Prince Charles because he was busy doing royal engagements. And um, then she comes across this bracelet that he ordered for Camilla. The discovery of the GF bracelet raised a lot of questions in Diana's mind. Um, I think there was a sense that she knew automatically that it was for Camilla, found on Charles's assistant's desk as a present, really, a farewell present, if you like. But what did the GF stand for? Did it stand for Girl Friday, which suggested an intimate relationship between Charles and Camilla? Some say it might have stood for their nicknames for each other, Fred and Gladys, although it was never confirmed what the initials meant. I think for Diana, what it may have triggered was an earlier wound about abandonment. I mean, this is a girl who would have experienced her own parents' divorce. This is a person who was sent off to boarding school when she was little. A lot of separation anxiety, a lot of abandonment issues may have been re-triggered in that because she would have felt, here I am on the outside looking in, I'm not part of this relationship, something is going on, and I don't feel loved in this particular situation. The battle over the bracelet made Diana consider pulling out of the wedding. She said to her sisters, I just can't go through with this. And they said to her very famously now, uh, Too Late Dutch, which is their nickname for her, your face is on the tea towels now, so you can't chicken out. Curiously, at the same moment, Charles was saying to Camilla, I can't go through with this. Both of them realised it was a mistake. Uh, and Diana, particularly because she was young, because she was volatile, uh, was taking it worse than Charles was. But outwardly, at least, they needed to try and keep up appearances. I had tea with them two days before the wedding, just the three of us, and they seemed besotted with each other. If Diana looked downbeat on the commemorative towel, she'd be positively fuming at what happened next. Apart from when Charles was on official duties, there was no time during which um, uh, Camilla and Charles' relationship didn't continue. And, and I would go so far as to say, right up to uh, Charles's wedding to Diana. As proceedings got underway, one half of the wedding party were supremely relaxed. 
Having been the crusty old bachelor, he hadn't been very interesting to either the press or the public, or very popular, until he decided to get married. And then suddenly he shot up to number one in the royal family as, as um, people loved him, they cheered him. He probably hadn't noticed that they probably weren't cheering him, actually, but as long as he was near Diana, he could think it was for him. Charles and Diana will forget everyone except each other as they take the vows to love each other in sickness and in health for better, for worse. I can't imagine that Camilla wasn't on Prince Charles's mind as he walked up and down the aisle. A little look to each side, possibly not a moment for recognising faces. Diana too was taking in all her surroundings and there may have been an unwanted sight in her peripheral vision. Think about it from a relationship point of view. You know, getting married to the man of your dreams and his ex is in pew number 17. That would have affected her emotionally. Everybody is um, emotionally engaged, but then there's this small distance around this one woman, Camilla. Um, she's doing what I call meerkat body language. So you just get this lone woman looking up and just gazing very coldly assessing her potential rival as she goes up the aisle. There were people who had colluded in what turned out to be a dreadful, dreadful historical mistake. And they included the Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, who'd been told that Diana didn't want to get married. And the Archbishop of Canterbury, Robert Runcie, who not only had been told that, he didn't, that she didn't want to get married, but that Charles didn't want to get married. And yet he, the head of the Church of England, presided over what was the biggest con job that the British royal family had ever pulled on the nation. As they traipsed back down the aisle, now man and wife, the congregation scanning continued, with Charles slowly walking into a future without his mistress, or so we all thought. So having initially been optimistic about Charles shaking her off, because they now were married and wanted to start a family, um, I think Diana quickly realised that she'd been rather naive in that assumption. For her part, Camilla did her best not to become unwanted baggage. From the outside, it's certainly true that Camilla didn't appear with Charles. She gave them a chance, or, or she appeared to give them a chance. And I think that would have been really tougher. She looks a bit of a lost soul at the wedding. She even made way for Diana as Charles's number one polo fan. Two years ago, the princess couldn't stand polo, but today she didn't seem to mind. That's marriage for you. I think in the immediate aftermath of the wedding, things settled down and relations between Charles and Diana and the Parker Bowles were cordial because I think there was a degree of separation between Charles and Camilla, which meant that Diana could actually start to enjoy her marriage. I have spoken to people who know, and they insist that um, uh, almost from the beginning, there was an unease between Charles and Diana. They had the children because they were under pressure to have children because for dynastic reasons. It's a very difficult role, not only to be a wife uh, to the heir to the throne, a mother to the heir and spare, but also to be a working royal uh, and, and in support of the Queen. So he, he was pretty proud of her. Uh, but I suppose came the sort of mid, mid to late 80s, um, the marriage wasn't going well. Whilst the press delighted in glimpses of the adorable cherubs in their matching outfits, being snapped on the school run every day was the least of Diana's concerns. I think that in those kinds of circles, the, the aristocracy and, and the royal family, there's an assumption that if it's not working, you can't get divorced, so you just build a separate life and you and you just turn a blind eye to the behavior of your spouse. Diana, on the other hand, felt that marriage was for life, it was for love, and that she'd been sold a pup. Charles had rekindled his love affair with Camilla, urging his staff to go to great lengths to keep it stum. Royals don't go around by themselves. They've got a retinue of staff and an entourage. So when he used to duck in and out of the palace, uh, Age used to nickname him the Prince of Darkness. Ironically, it seems the only time Diana could be sure she had Charles to herself were on official trips to the other side of the world. 
she's being left to walk behind and she's being left very much to her own devices. He goes off with somebody else. She barely seems to have somebody with her. I think, again, you know, he, he sees the crowds cheering and this is his moment, you know, suddenly he's Mr Popular and you can see he dives into the crowd because he thinks everybody suddenly loves him, he's the centre of attention. And, and Diana's just the sort of, you know, the dessert. As much as Diana tried to block relations with Camilla, it was all in vain. I think it would have been incredibly difficult as the relationship came under increasing strain to put on quite the performance for the public, the cameras, the world media and say, you know, hey, we're a united front and a happy couple. When you know that inside there were probably resentments, uh, arguments, anger, feelings of betrayal just boiling under the surface. And at times we have seen those things burst fourth and in february 1989 a decade of tension came to a head at the 40th birthday party of camilla's sister annabelle elliott which diana turned up to unannounced and i think she managed to corral camilla into a room and they have this rather terse interchange during which time diana says leave my husband alone and camilla says words to the to the effect well you've got two lovely children um, why can't I have him? Diana seemed to have been transformed from this shy teenager into a woman who was, I mean, paradoxically, a bit more like Camilla. She was tougher and she decided she didn't want to put up with this anymore. She wasn't going to be the complacent wife. 1989 brought further humiliation as Camilla and Charles were pictured together in Turkey. Charles, throughout this, has made the mistake of believing that he, as Prince of Wales, could do more or less what he wanted to do, and that if he wanted to have a mistress, then so be it. But behind the vacant stairs, Diana had been secretly plotting with biographer Andrew Morton to get her story out. We are not in the business of hyping publications, was the only comment from Buckingham Palace this morning. Diana, her true story, looks certain to be on the way to the top of the bestsellers list. She felt that she, she was mischaracterized as this woman inside the royal family and she wanted to express who she really was the book would be like a grenade thrown into the heart of the monarchy but was this diana's way of dishing the dirt first having foreknowledge she was soon to be caught in her own scandal her motivation i think was to get her retaliation in first um, was to articulate her story before prince charles did squidgy gate work conversations, intimate conversations that were recorded between Princess Diana and James Gilby, a very close friend, perhaps more than a friend, just discussing the difficulties that she was suffering in her life and her unhappiness. This added a new dimension. It suggested that perhaps Prince Charles wasn't the only one misbehaving in his marriage. And Camilla made a rare public statement, sympathising with the troubled couple. It was reported that she had acted in total ignorance of news of the breakdown of Charles and Diana's marriage and said that she knew no more than the average person on the street. Although, of course, that was later proved to be complete and utter nonsense. That proof came in the form of her own phone tape scandal of salacious sweet nothings with the air. The Camilligate tapes were virtually pornographic. I mean, for, a, for a, a member of the royal family to, to be saying the sort of things he says on the tape to a woman uh, he was not married to was really extraordinary. The transcript of the alleged sexy talk first appeared in the Rupert Murdoch-owned Australian New Idea magazine, though the UK papers were unusually reticent to go full guns blazing with the scoop. We have taken the decision today not to publish the full transcript of the Camilla Gate tapes. A Murdoch-backed paper were the ones to finally break rank. It was only a matter of time before the tabloids printed what's been circulating in private for days, the full transcript of an alleged conversation between the Prince of Wales and Camilla Parker Bowles. And now, everyone in the UK could collectively squirm at the juicy details. There's a moment in the tape where Camilla turns around and says, well, I've never done anything in my life. And he says something along the lines of, well, you have done something, you've loved me as if that's enough to make Camilla's life complete. For Camilla, she would have gone from having a discreet 
private relationship with Charles out of the headlines, below the radar, to suddenly being in the heat of the spotlight. And then, of course, there's the tampon moment, which will go down in history as one of the royal's most embarrassing moments. This idea that Charles loved Camilla so much that he would be willing to be her tampax. Princess Diana might have been a young and naive girl when she entered the royal family. But by the time she left it, the whole institution wondered what to do next. The War of the Waleses had been a bitter battle. After Charles and Diana both aired their dirty laundry so publicly, the Queen stepped in to push the divorce proceedings. The effect of the War of the Waleses on Camilla was catastrophic because it cast her as the scarlet woman. She really was regarded as the lowest of the low at that point. Camilla's love for Charles must have been such that she was able to stand by her man. She must also be incredibly emotionally resilient to cope with being thrust into the spotlight as the mistress, as the bad guy in this story. And I think it's testament to her character that she was able to withstand that. So the woman with a love of hunting had become the hunted. With the media dispatched to a remote corner of Wiltshire, to the annoyance of Andrew Parker Bowles and a defiantly gesticulating Camilla. She was in great distress. The one thing you can say about Camilla is that she has an amazing backbone and that she was always going to be able to survive in a way that fragile Diana uh, found it much more difficult to survive. But at that time, suddenly, Camilla became the victim, not Diana. And I think very wisely during the War of the Waleses, she realised that no good could possibly come of her trying to explain her position. The Parker Bowles' marriage was also left in tatters. They divorced in 1995, saying they no longer had anything in common. The spotlight which suddenly shone upon Charles and Camilla, you would think would put an end to the relationship that frightened they would run away from it, that Charles would realize that his duty was to stay with his wife, Diana. In fact, what it did was it forged the bond between them and made their relationship that much stronger. By late August 1996, Charles and Diana had divorced. And the now officially unburdened heir began campaigning to turn the public perception of Camilla around. There are a number of strategic errors made by both Charles and his supporting team during the following years. And something, I think, which the Queen felt very uncomfortable about. I think that she thought that it would be much better if they maintained separate lives, separate houses, uh, of course continue their relationship. She understood that relationship, but I think she wanted nothing that was going to rock the royal boat. To her credit, Camilla never went on the offensive. I think it is commendable that Camilla never really fought back. Camilla, over the years, has sacrificed so much for the love of Prince Charles, really. Um, she could have gone out all guns blazing. She decided to take a step back and just accept her fate. Meanwhile, Diana had started dating Dodi Al-Fayed. As the Camilla charm offensive seemed to be softening the public perception, if perhaps not gaining universal acclaim. Would you be happy one day for Camilla to be queen? No, I wouldn't. Do you think Camilla should be queen one day? No, I think that's going too far. Two months later, tragedy struck. Just to confirm the news that Diana, Princess of Wales, has died in a car accident in Paris, which also killed her companion, Dodi fired. And as a nation grieved, Camilla was forced back into hiding. There had been, in the moments before Diana died, uh, an assumption by the British public that Camilla was now the non-negotiable part of Charles's life. But the moment that Diana died, she suddenly became, again, public enemy number one. The couple had to wait a further two years before the time was deemed right for their first official outing and Camilla's sister's 50th birthday bash at the Ritz. The Prince of Wales and Camilla Parker Bowles seen together in public quite clearly. No secret about their relationship now, none possible at all. The photograph 
the people have waited so long, the picture the people have waited so long to see. There was always going to be a huge response to Charles and Camilla's first outing at the Ritz because this was putting Camilla on an official footing alongside a future king, basically saying to the world, you might not like it, you might not like her, this is the woman I love and this is a woman I see in my future. It was well known at this time that the reason Charles hadn't married Camilla in the first place wasn't that he didn't want to, it was the royal family interfering. To mark the occasion, Camilla wore a necklace which was owned by her great-grandmother and the favourite mistress of Edward VII, Alice Keppel. Oh, Camilla's a very clever girl. She always wore that Alice Keppel necklace, if she possibly could, just as a reminder that she had every right to be a royal mistress and maybe a royal wife as much as anybody else. Having been the most hated woman on the planet, it was always going to be a slow sell, but Camilla wasn't going anywhere. Her stoic determination finally won over the Queen, and against all the odds, she married Charles in 2005. But as Camilla valiantly battled against the winds in Windsor, a nasty storm was kicking up outside Kensington Palace. I disapprove of this marriage today. I disapprove of the way Charles and Camilla treated Diana. It was despicable. Fortunately for Camilla, the naysayer's bark didn't have too much bite. And over the last 15 years, she's become part of the establishment in her own right. Camilla has become, in many people's view, the most successful new member of the royal family in a very long time. She has worked very hard uh, to create an act which people will like and find non-threatening. She never wanted to be the new Diana. So she's a credit to the royal family, she's a credit to Charles, and she's, she's looked upon by William and Harry as good for their father, and as far as they're concerned, if their dad is happy, they're happy too. When Charles becomes king, Camilla will be the queen consort, never officially a queen. But she'll be right behind Charles, as she's always been. Camilla is Camilla. Camilla, what you see is what you get. She doesn't put any airs and graces. She doesn't pretend to be anything other than Camilla. And that is what is so endearing. In a way, she's taken a leaf out of the Queen's book. She's never complained, she's never explained, and she's just got on with it. She's kept calm and carried on. I suspect the Queen looks back now and thinks, if only we'd let Charles marry Camilla in the first place, because they will be aware now that at no stage would Camilla have ever gone to the press, gone secretly to a journalist and supplied information for a book about her disastrous marriage. In other words, the Queen and the royal family have realised that Camilla is actually one of them, she, in a way that Diana never was. And I think that's made it easier for the Queen to accept. Whilst Diana may never have been suited to becoming Charles's Queen, more than 20 years since her death, she still remains one of the nation's most beloved members of the royal family. And though Camilla might not ascend to the same levels of popularity, there's no doubt affection towards her continues to grow as we approach the time when her husband becomes king. Forever linked. Her school friend said of Camilla, she is pathologically ambitious. She will only marry a very rich, influential, powerful man. She wants to have fun. Whereas with Diana, you never got that sense that her main purpose in life was to have fun. Events would bring the most unlikely love triangle together. There were people who had colluded in what turned out to be the biggest con job that the British royal family had ever pulled on the nation. Everybody is um, emotionally engaged, but then there's this small distance around this one woman, Camilla. She's doing what I call meerkat body language. So you just get this lone woman looking up and just gazing very coldly, assessing her potential rival as she goes up the aisle. And how both women would go on to blow the monarchy wide open. We are not in the business of hyping publications, was the only comment from Buckingham Palace this morning. Diana, her true story, looks certain to be on the way to the top of the bestsellers list. She thought that she, she was mischaracterised as this woman inside the royal family, and she wanted to express who she really was. 
the Camilligate tapes were virtually pornographic. I mean, for a member of the Royal 